street. Okay, here we go. <laughs>2019年5月,剑桥大学秋季尔学院小田花园正式竣工揭幕。在揭幕仪式之后,马丁雅克做客风云对话,就当前的国际秩序和人类文明发展进程发表他的看法。马丁雅克是英国剑桥大学政治与
In the Western tradition, nations are much more recent and they're constructed on the basis of being nation states. China is very old. I mean, at least it dates from you know, about 2,000 years as a relatively unified polity. But China is not primarily a nation state today. It is primarily a civilization state. Or, I mean, I think actually it's a hybrid. It's a civilization state first and a nation state second. Why is it a nation state? Because it had to adapt to an international order which was not of its own making at the end of the 19th century. So it had to begin to acquire the forms of the nation state. But on the basis of a civilization state. Exactly. Is there another country that is the same sort of category with China? Can you think of any, like Russia, is it? China is obviously a very interesting example because it's very old and basically its history, despite all the problems it's had, is, relatively speaking, a very continuous history. Now, uh, I think that if you look around the world, you can see other countries that have some of the same attributes. I mean, India has elements of being a civilizational state. Russia may be. Iran has a very long uh, history with, which has got certain civilizational aspects to it. When the West dominated the world, everything was seen in, through Western eyes, through Western lenses. So everything ultimately should be like the West, or would be like the West, or was already like the West. That's the Western mentality. Whereas the rise of China teaches us something different. The rise of China says, look, we're not really a nation state in anything like the same way. It's only part of our identity because primarily we're a civilization state. And then you look around the world and you realize that there are, is great diversity in the way in which states have grown up. But they've been forced during the Western era to essentially adapt to the Western norms. In the interview, Martin Yaka has often mentioned the concept of a nation-state country. He believes that the Yangyang state, China, is in fact a nation-state country, but it has a nation-state character. In the eyes of Martin Yaka, the history of China's long history, because the nation and the nation are one and the same, is a nation-state country. Similar to China, there is also India, Iran, Belarus, and Russia. But the characteristics are not very similar to China's characteristics. 然而，在十九世纪末，羸弱的中国被迫加入到由西方主导的世界体系，开始纳入诸多民族国家元素。那也是为什么现在的中国同时具备民族国家和文明国家的双重特点。而依照这样的理论，美国又属于怎样的国家呢？对于世界两大国属性的了解，或许有助于理解目前两国之间正在进行着的。Well, back to your statement that China is a civilization state. Then, how would you categorize America? I wouldn't call America a, a, a civilization state. I I think that America is also not this reducible to the European tradition either. What happened was that Europe, in its pomp and its growing power, began to navigate the world, discover the world, and then uh, they disco discovered America. As far as Europe, the European mind was, they were discovering America. And, they, and they, what, what happened then? Essentially, they began to settle in America and they destroyed the native Indian population. They were effectively subject to ethnic cleansing or genocide. This is extremely important. Because you cannot understand American history unless you know how America developed in the first place. That uh, sounds bloody. So how would you define the, the nature of the state of America then? Well, I mean, I, I haven't got a term for it for, uh, for the, immediately for you in the interview. But uh, I think that America is, uh, 
you know, was a settler society. A settler a society. Settler. Now, question comes to what would happen when a civilization state meets the settler society? Well, they're very different. Very different, very, so very of course. Different. There's going to be a clash, if not a clash. A clash. I think that look, diversity uh, in in any form means people are different. It doesesn't mean they don't have shared things in common, but they are different. So when you're confronted with difference, you can have different reactions to it. 二零一九年五月十四日。中国外交部发言人在例行记者会中首次使用中美贸易战表述，取代原先中美贸易摩擦的官方定义。五月十六日，美国总统特朗普签署行政命令，宣布进入国家紧急状态，允许美国禁止外国对手拥有或掌控的公司提供电信设备和服务。美国商务部宣布将华为及其七十家公司列入出口管制实体名单之列。命令未经批准的美国公司不得销售产品和技术给华为公司。六月二日，中国商务部发表关于中美经贸磋商的中方立场白皮书。六月三日，美国贸易代表办公室和美国财政部发表联合声明，称对中方发表的白皮书感到失望，再次指出是中方反悔，并称美方对中方采取的行动旨在制止中方的不公平贸易行为。而中方随即做出回应，指美方颠倒黑白、强词夺理。就在外界对中美关系持悲观观望态度，并且纷纷议论这究竟是修昔底德陷阱还是文明冲突的时候，六月十八日，中美两国国家领导人通电话的消息似乎让人看到了曙光。特朗普也发推文宣布，两国领导人会在 G 二零上见面。Then, how do you view bilateral relation between China and America, which obviously is one of the most important bilateral relationships in the world? The relationship between the two countries in the present context is very much influenced and shaped by the American fear of its decline and the threat that China poses because of its rise. Now. We know that the relationship between China and the United States has not been like that in the same way for 40 years,、mm. since the beginnings of you know Nixon, Mao, Deng Xiaoping, and so on. Actually, the great thing has been that by and large they've got on rather well together, even though they're very different, even though they come from different places historically, and so on. The problem is now is that the United States. Is something different, which is the United States feels that it is the top dog in the world, and it wants to stay the top top dog in the world, and it resents the rise of China, and that's why the relationship suddenly is becoming more conflictual. And do you think this state of relationship is going to last, this unsettling relationship between China and America for the time being? Is it going to last? I think it's going to last a while. I mean, let's say that. The, the, the relative stability. So we are、uh, now in, entering another stage. We're, we're entering a new era. We, the, the era. This is my guess, because we, none of us know.、No. We had an era starting in 40 years ago or longer. You know, since 1970. I mean, it's been a long time. Yeah.、Uh, where there was a relative stability and and、uh, and、uh, a degree of harmony, even. Uh, in the relationship, in some senses, between the United States and, and China, and it was good for the global now, growth. Oh yeah, of course. You know, forms of cooperation and uh, and uh, mutuality yeah, are much better for the world. The yeah, yeah, dream, absolutely, yeah. no question. And now we're entering a new era. Yeah, and the reason the thing situation has changed is because for that period since 1970, the era of stability, the relationship between the United States and China might have been. Rather stable and cooperative, but it was based on a fundamental inequality. The inequality was that the United States was far stronger than China. I mean, China in 1978, its economy was one、uh, was one twentieth of the size of the American economy. They were not, you know, they were not they were not vaguely equal. The situation is different now 
because China is now much closer to the, much, you know, is a powerful player in its own right in the world, and in some senses, you know, second most powerful, largest economy in the world, and so on. Country can put all its, I would say, energy and emphasis on the human capital, which is behind the startup nation uh, concept. Asking question is, if you don't do it, you've not learned anything. 领航者远赴以色列，采访顶级大学校长、科学家，揭示。二零一九年六月，上演着多场外交重头戏。中国国家主席习近平对俄罗斯进行国事访问，美国总统特朗普应女王邀请到访伦敦，日本首相安倍历史性的访问伊朗，并带去特朗普的信函。上合组织峰会和亚信峰会分别在吉尔吉斯共和国比什凯和吉克斯坦首都杜尚别召开，而六月末，日本大阪即将迎来 G 二零。中美贸易战进行时，世界各国自然也会做各自的掂量和计划。例如，英国在使用华为五 G 问题上的表态和行动受到世界高度关注。而在六月初，新加坡举行的香格里拉对话会议上，新加坡总理李显龙的一番讲话赢得世界多国一致好评。Our world is at a turning point. Globalization is under siege. Tensions between the U.S. and China are growing. Like everyone else, we in Singapore are anxious. We wonder what the future holds and how countries can collectively find a way forward to maintain peace and prosperity in the world. Singapore Business Times in August recently published the headline, "The Chinese Government Has Forced the U.S. to Accept Other Countries' Rules for Exporting to Other Countries." A letter to the U.S. 督促美国应该在制定全球规则方面给中国更大话语权，以避免一场旷日持久的冲突，让小国被迫在世界最大的两个经济体之间选边站。中美之间的贸易战是否会在世界各国之间埋下一道鸿沟，是当前许多政界、学界、经济界人士关切的一个问题。Back to the U.S. bilateral relationship between China and America, so we believe that the clash between America and China, although triggered by America, is going to backfire on America itself eventually. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, it's it, it's not in it's not in America's long-term interest to behave like this. But that doesn't mean a country won't continue to behave like this because it's because how countries behave. Is a more complicated question than just what, what is objectively in your Now interest. Now we are entering a new era. What does it mean for America, for China, for the rest of the world? I think it introduces a lot of uncertainty. We can't simply extrapolate for a period. You know, it looked at global, spread of globalization and so on. We thought we could sort of see which way things are going. Now it's rather more complicated than that. We don't know how far. This deterioration in the relationship between the United States and China is going to be. Is it going? Could it? Could it be a new type of Cold War? Could it? Could it? Yes. Yes, it could be. I mean, what what could happen is that I'm, I'm not predicting this, but surmising, yeah,、mm -hmm. speculating. You get you get a trade war, you know, tariffs, and、uh, what, what we're already seeing,、uh, or we could get, uh, uh, that could be. Uh, uh, deterioration in relationship between、uh, the two countries, so that、uh, there's restrictions on Chinese going to the United States. You've seen bits of this already in terms of scholars being denied visas and so on. You could get restrictions on Chinese students going to the United States. You've already got restrictions on Chinese companies buying American companies.、Uh, that's been happening over the last few years. So what happens is you begin to get this kind of estrangement, if you like. Uh, and I, I hope this does not happen. You know, I hope that what happens is that okay, there's a spat, there's a disagreement, but 
both countries can find a way to constrain it and the rest of the world can help to constrain a deterioration in relations. That's what I hope. But you can't deny the possibility that it might be rather worse. And then, now, what kind of, uh, I mean, effects or impacts that this kind of change the relationship between China and America is going to make on the relationship between China and other countries, say, EU countries? This is a very important question. Mm. I think that... Europe is not in the same place as the United States, but they are wedded over a long period of history to a close relationship, um, especially since 1945. But we can see, not just now, but over a longer period, there's been a sort of... They've tended to move away from each other. You know, Germany is a classic example. Germany is not very close to the United States. You can see it in the reaction in many, um, many European leaders to Trump. I mean, they do not approve of Trump. They do not believe in his form of unilateralism. I think there's a, a, an interesting possibility that, that Europe is in the process of moving away from the United States, but we don't know how far, and we don't know how much that will affect Europe's relationship with China. Now, we know it's true in, the, in, the, in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, there's a very strong interest in being part, and they are part, of Belt and Road. And we know now that is also true of Greece and, to a lesser extent, Italy. And maybe over time, um, and I would like to see this myself, that Germany and Britain and France become part of Belt and Road. And the fact is, you see, that if Europe begins to drift away from the United States, this could constrain the way America behaves, because it may not want that. Or if it's Trump, he doesn't mind, perhaps. But, an, but an, 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 a different but American... Trump is not going to stay there forever. Exactly. So you can get a different leader with a different set of priorities. Yeah. So and back to the title of the book, When China Rules the World, what do you actually mean by that? And how would you be able to answer to it, if it's a question? Um, I think that uh, this is a slow process. I mean, well, actually, it's a rapid process historically, but it takes, for us living now, mm -hmm. quite a long time. Um, and what I think it means is you know, the Chinese economy is now nearly the same size as the American economy by certain measures bigger and by 2030 it will be 2035 20, 20, I expect it to be twice the size of the, the American economy and with economic power comes all sorts of other possibilities as we've seen since over the last 10 years China is able to exercise power in new forms that it couldn't before because it didn't have a strong enough economic base and I think that uh, China will become, uh, and, and when, when you're a strong economic power, you have influence over the behavior of lots of other countries, and you can see that happening. So I think that China's economic power is the first thing, um, but, but I, I, I think that you'll see China's now playing a much bigger role in international bodies, the international system, China's been quite correct. We respect the international system, we're not trying to overturn it, but China does think that it needs improving. Mm. So what has happened over the last 10 years? I mean, Belt and Road, uh, the Asian, investment, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, China uh, playing a much more active role in various international bodies and so on. You can see how China's influence has grown a lot. Mm. Do you think that's a positive factor on the I mean, global arena? I think that uh, China's rise uh, is very positive for the world. Um, I think China can bring a lot, but the point I would like to emphasize is it represents 18% of the world's population. And the great problem of the period of the last 200, 300 years is that the world has been dominated by a tiny sliver of humanity that lived in Europe and North America. Things are going to change. And so with the rise of no, it's not just about the rise of China, it's about the rise of the developing world. So, in effect, most of the world has been disenfranchised because it's had no power. So, disenfranchised from determining the direction of the world, if you like, in the broad sense of the world, the governance of the world. And I regard the rival of China to be extremely positive in this context, just like I regard the rival, the rival of India or Indonesia or whatever to be part, to have a say, to be enfranchised in relationship to these things. 
On many counts, China's growth is a tremendous boon, both to itself and to the world. China has substantially transformed its backward, centrally planned economy into a middle-income, market-driven one, even though it's still far from being a full market economy. More than 850 million Chinese people have been lifted out of poverty, an achievement unprecedented in human history. China's development and success has benefited the world too. China has become a massive production and manufacturing base, lowering costs for the world's producers, first for labor-intensive goods and now increasingly for high-tech and technology-intensive production. Having gained much from the international system, China now has a substantial stake in upholding it and making it work for the global community. Chinese leaders have spoken up strongly in support of globalization and a rules-based international order. China must now convince other countries, through its actions, that it does not take a transactional and mercantilist approach, but rather an enlightened and inclusive view of its long-term interests. The rest of the world, too, has to adjust to a larger role for China. Countries have to accept that China will continue to grow and strengthen and that it is neither, neither possible nor wise for them to prevent this from happening. China will have its own legitimate interests and ambitions, including to develop indigenously advanced technologies like infocoms and artificial intelligence. As a major stakeholder in the international system, China should be encouraged to play commensurate and constructive roles in supranational institutions like the IMF, World Bank, and the WTO. If China cannot do so, it will create its own alternatives. The United States, being the preeminent power, has the most difficult adjustment to make. But however difficult the task, it is well worth the U.S. forging a new understanding that will integrate China's aspirations within the current system of rules and norms. New international rules need to be made in many areas, including trade and intellectual property, cybersecurity, and social media. China will expect a say in this process because it sees the present rules as having been created in the past without its participation. And this is an entirely reasonable expectation. The bottom line is that the US and China need to work together and with other countries too to bring the global system up to date and, not, and to not upend 